Welcome. I'm Susan Denser, Senior Policy Fellow for the Duke Margolis Center, and I'm delighted to be here today with Chris Jennings of Jennings Policy Strategies and Bill Hoagland of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Chris is a veteran who helped to formulate healthcare policy in Democratic administrations, including those of Pres Presidents Clinton and Obama. He's also an informal advisor now to the Biden campaign and was also on the Unity Task Force that helped to formulate recommendations for the Democratic Party platform this year. Bill is a longtime staff veteran of the Senate Budget Committee on the Republican side. Beyond that, he was also a, a major advisor to the Senate Republican leadership over the years and is known to be the leading national expert on federal budget rules and the congressional budgeting process. Process. So between the two of them, they bring a terrific bipartisan perspective on almost everything related to healthcare policy. So just a delight to be with them here today. Let me remind you that we will be taking questions for this panel. So please submit those in the session chat box if you would. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Bill and Chris, as we know, the polls clearly show now Vice President Biden well ahead in the presidential race. Of course, we know that what matters is the Electoral College. So we'll see what happens on election day and election night and possibly thereafter. Uh, we also know though the makeup of the Congress still seems to be somewhat uncertain, particularly obviously on the Senate side. So I'd love you both to paint a brief picture of what health reform could look like first under a Biden administration or under a second Trump term. So Chris, let's start with you. What, what's health policy look like, uh, at least in the first year of a Biden administration? Well, thank you, Susan. It's good to see you even via Zoom, and I'm happy to do so. Um, I will say that um, even though uh, the polling looks very, very good, um, not just nationally, but on state by state, uh, Vice President is not taking anything for granted. And um, is not counting um, anything um, in terms of the final outcome of the election until we actually hear from the voters. Um, however, if those polls do stay up, uh, I think he will not only be president, but I believe he'll also have a Democratic Senate, but we will, that, that's, that's something to your point, that might take a little bit longer to absolutely secure that knowledge. In terms of the vice president's vision about health reform. I think one is to first stop uh, the undermining of the Affordable Care Act in the first place and reverse policies that he believes have actually shifted costs to uh, people in terms of less security and higher out-of-pocket costs and exposure to pre-existing condition exclusions being applied to populations who purchase products outside those protections but also to make healthcare far more affordable and less complex. One thing that the vice president has seen throughout the campaign is the public's concern about not just pricing, but benefits and cost sharing going up and up and up over 10 years, eating up a substantial amount of wage increases. In fact, it far more than triples and quadruples deductibles and out-of-pocket costs, the wage increases. Um, so, He's looking to significantly both do a greater amount of cost containment in the first place by providing a new public option to constrain costs and provide more competition. And secondly, to very aggressively address very high prescription drug prices, which again, uh, we pay so much more than any other country in the world. But as we do, and as we do constrain cost, he feels, uh, very, he, he feels that we do need to reinvest back in the Affordable Care Act um, by providing more tax credit subsidies to lower premiums and cost sharing altogether to address those very real concerns and to provide through that public option new choices for people who are in employer-based coverage, which we've seen very recently in COVID-19 as being very, very vulnerable, people to have access to those subsidies right into the marketplace. Um, I'm going to stop there because I know you don't want me to talk and talk and talk, but I, I, there, there's certainly many, many other uh, policy uh, initiatives that he has advocated along the way, and I hope we have an opportunity to talk about them. Great, and we will do precisely that, uh, Chris, but thank you for starting us off. Bill, I, I, we, we all know it's a little difficult to foresee what a second uh, Trump administration would do it with respect to healthcare, but to the best of your ability, 
as a longtime observer, what, what would you say uh, that policy would look like in a second Trump term? Well, thank you, Susan. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with my friend, Chris Jennings. Uh, uh, we've been worked together many, many years. And uh, while we may differ on some uh, issues, we tend to still remain friends throughout this, uh, throughout these years that we've worked together. Um, it's difficult. Yes, it's difficult to uh, predict what a uh, Trump, uh, second term Trump administration might uh, do as it relates to health care. I would say that uh, 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 that. Uh, it's difficult for me because I believe that uh, uh, my what I would like to see happen versus what would happen are probably different uh, than the, a, a Trump administration. But having said that, I think uh, you'll ex you should expect first of all that we'll be continuing to the Trump administration will continue be continuing to address the issue of the of the COVID virus. I think that's uh, going to continue to be an issue early on in the next administration, whether it's a Biden administration or a Trump administration, particularly on the distribution and. Uh, of the uh, vaccine, uh, hopefully that will have been produced by then. Uh, who gets that vaccine, where it goes, who, who's in line for it, and how uh, it, that's going to be, that's still going to dominate early on in the next administration. Uh, clearly also, as we know, uh, the president's uh, uh, Department of Justice supports the case that's that'll be before the Supreme Court as it relates to uh, repealing uh, uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, Quite frankly, I think uh, indications are from the uh, hearing this week and the judiciary that there's some, uh, uh, I think there's some indication that I would uh, uh, support that uh, uh, severability is an issue that now would not bring down the entire Affordable Care Act. But clearly, if the Supreme Court uh, is to rule and bringing down the entire Affordable Care Act, we have a tremendous amount of work ahead of us and the administration then, if it is a Trump administration, is then really on the, on the, on the, on the ticket, let's say, to explain what their alternative has been, which we have been waiting to see for quite some time. I do think that generally you could expect that a second term Trump administration to focus on uh, a greater uh, state and local uh, authority, uh, block granting, the Medicaid program as an example. Uh, uh, some of the same issues that Chris has talked about in terms of the controlling costs will continue to be an issue. We know he does have some proposals as it relates to prescription drug prices. That will continue to be an issue going forward. Uh, uh, I think also we should expect a uh, 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 focus on issues associated with the uh, uh, maybe work requirements in the Medicaid program going forward. A number of these conservative issues, plus also then the use of the tax code for uh, improving upon uh, people's ability to purchase uh, their own private health insurance with uh, tax credits through the tax code. Uh, so the same, uh, in other words, I'd say the same policies that he's been at least at initiating through executive orders. I do want to just make one quick observation, though. Um, as of today, uh, and Chris, I think is uh, right. I think uh, uh, the chances are looking uh, like there uh, could be a switch in the United States Senate. And uh, if there is a switch in the United States Senate, the House remains Democratic. Um, we're going to have uh, another four years of real knockdown, drag out uh, uh, um, problems political problems, I think, and getting things done. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. We'll get into that, I guess, later in our questions that you have for us. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Bill. And ju just to clarify, I, th I think you said earlier, it seems as if the court, uh, the Supreme Court, it, uh, would eventually rule that the issue of the, of the uh, zeroing out of the mandate penalty can be severed from the rest of the law. Correct. Yes. That's great. Yes. Uh, yes. My uh, listen. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'll leave, it, leave this maybe Chris and others and yourself uh, to weigh in on this. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but whenever we did major legislation, whether it was uh, reconciliation bills over the years on Capitol Hill, we always had a con in the conference agreement uh, coming out of the House and Senate. We usually placed a severability clause. Uh, unfortunately, the way the Affordable Care Act came together, there was no severability clause in there. So I, as I, again, reading between the lines, I believe uh, the uh, Justice Barrett has indicated something that, that she refers to as presumptive severability. 
And uh, if that's the if that was if that's the case, then I am uh, today at least thinking that the likelihood of a, a total repeal of the Affordable Care Act is not uh, not likely. Well, as Susan. Yes, Chris. I, I just have to weigh in a little bit here. Um, of course, uh, the Trump administration Justice Department is making precisely the arg the opposite argument that the whole law must fall. Um, and no one can make a prediction of a Supreme Court as we've seen time and time again. So that's one. It's, it's always interesting to me now that uh, a lot of Republicans are saying, don't worry, it won't be as bad as you fear, <laughs> you know, which is, which is an interesting argument, even though their president is making the argument to strike the whole, the whole law. But probably just as importantly, since the underpinning of most people's discussions around health reform has been about the imperative of ensuring that pre-existing condition exclusions are no longer permitted, that part of the law would not uh, be protected, uh, even if you did do this separability. So under any scenario, there's some significant concerns about what's happening with the Supreme Court. And I just have to say, uh, from a Democrat perspective, there's this endless targeting of the law and and criticizing it and trying to undermine it is um, is has has hurt not just people but the Republican Party as a whole and I think it's time we moved on frankly um, but I, I I do also want to make a point that while 2019 highlighted all these issues and as you recall 2018 was an election once again so much around the issue of healthcare costs and pre-existing conditions and the fear of repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. 2020 has been dominated uh, certainly by COVID-19. Um, and uh, we've, seen, we've seen the importance of what presidential leadership means to this nation under siege from such a public health threat. Um, and, you know, frankly, this was an opportunity for President Trump to lead and I, I think he uh, could have made this a moment uh, to make positive history and, uh, and, and really bring us together. Uh, and, and it's just so disappointing and dismaying that that has not been the case. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this election may be going the way it's going, but it, it's it's really remarkable that in both 2019 and 2020, healthcare has been the defining issue, and I think it will play a huge role in the election on November 3rd. Uh, Susan, can I just? Uh, I, I don't. I don't listen. I, I, as I said, uh, you asked me what a Trump administration <laughs> would do versus what, and I might have some different uh, wishes as to what the outcome is. But just to make, I want to pick up on Chris's last point, which I think is uh, very, very critical. And that is healthcare is the number one issue. I'm looking this morning at an economist YouGov uh, survey, and the number one issue was in looking at the percentage that defined as very important for the electorate, 72% rated it very important. And another 22% another said somewhat important. 94% of the Amer of the, uh, those surveyed put healthcare as the number one issue. And I think that COVID is, not, is really uh, part of driving that. But even more dramatic from my uh, perspective was this survey found that of those who have already voted, this was a poll of last week uh, that we were, of those who have already voted, 85% of those who voted have already voted said healthcare was the most important issue on the ballot. So this uh, clearly, healthcare is the critical issue going into this election. Uh, indeed, and that's why we got such a great set of things to speak about today. So let us uh, let us move on to some of the uh, other proposals uh, that you both have referenced. Chris, I want to come back to the fact that Biden has proposed both a Medicare buy-in at age 60, effectively lowering the eligibility age of Medicare to age 60, also a public option. And of course, we the public option hasn't been fully articulated, but it's at least theoretically possible that it could be 
very much look like a plan that's modeled on Medicare Advantage that would be available in exchanges. It would obviously be paying providers something closer to Medicare rates in order to be more affordable. Uh, so leaving aside for a moment the politics of getting proposals like that through the Congress, how what thought has been given to how these proposals might exist side by side uh, in a in a sort of reformed health insurance system uh, going forward? Um, sure, Susan. Well, as you recall, the the Democratic if, if there's one thing that people can remember about the Democratic primary debate, and most people don't remember anything, <laughs> but um, that those that do remember will remember that the, the most uh, divisive debate amongst the Democrat was a very uh, forceful discourse around whether we should be moving towards a Medicare for all type policy uh, right away, uh, quickly, uh, uh, or whether we should look at an alternative approach to build on the Affordable Care Act and to provide more competition and choices. And uh, the vice president uh, came out very early with his policy, even um, thwarting a lot of people who were recommending him to move to the, to the left of the party and to, to acknowledge the, the base's passion about this issue. But he felt that uh, we couldn't afford to disrupt the system that in, in any way that quickly or that expensively. And that the better course of action was to address the problems that we're currently facing and dealing with cost and complexity and coverage through the public option. Now the, the Medicare 60 policy uh, is another uh, you could argue a public option uh, for a very vulnerable population, people who are 60 and above. And uh, it, it, it's a, it, it's it, in many ways, just another choice. People at that age may choose that they want to start phasing back into a Medicare like benefit, and they would actually be able to opt into a Medicare benefit uh, option, whereas, or they could stay as it, where the rest of the working American population is in the marketplace um, or to retain their employer sponsored coverage. So it's just another choice for maybe a, a vulnerable population who is thinking about uh, where they want to be headed towards over the next several years. Um, uh, we fully anticipate people will make all sorts of different choices as to what's, what's best for them. Last thing I want to talk about is just, just the point you raised, which it, it is ironic that when some people criticize the uh, e even a public option, which is a pretty moderate approach to dealing with some of our problems that we currently face, um, the same people who are advocating for um, Med MA, the Medicare Advantage Program, um, really have the exact same type of model. They have a very strong public option, which is the traditional Medicare program with a very large selection of private plans. And as you know, really it's almost now 30, what, 35, 36% of the Medicare population has chosen to do that. And the MA plans have been able to use the fee-for-service uh, program as somewhat of a negotiating leverage point to secure better prices for their beneficiaries that they serve. So in many ways, it, it looks very similar to what the vice president is proposing for the rest of the population. Well, and just to stay on this briefly, Chris, uh, you reference the rather substantial difference of opinion within the party that yes. led many to be for Medicare for all. The, uh, with respect to the public option and the Medicare buy-in, that those same progressives in the party are very much against any involvement of, of private plans in uh, a Medicare buy-in or a public option arrangement. So how, how could that debate be reconciled? Well, I mean, I say two things. One, the reason why our base is so that they have uh, a lot of reason to be frustrated with our healthcare system. 
uh, it's too expensive, it's too complex. Um, and they are right to raise uh, many of the shortcomings that people are extremely frustrated with. Um, but I think they see that a vice president who is committed to addressing the very real issues that consumers feel. And I think a public option uh, is a great compromise uh, between where we are and where they uh, wish to be. And, um, and, and I think uh, you'll, you know, you've seen that the party has come together in the Unity Task Force. And indeed, to your point, added the Medicare 60 population uh, a policy uh, as part of that ongoing conversation. And, and so I, I, I think they see this as a, a compromise, but something that uh, they, and something they feel they can get behind because they know it's long overdue that the public have had access to more affordable options. And I think that's what the Biden vision well, I know that's what the Biden um, vision uh, is promoting. Bill, in the event of a Biden victory and potentially also a, a, a shift of control to uh, Democrats in the Senate, where do you think Republicans would be on these proposals? Would they in fact oppose a public option even if it were constructed on a platform that looked a lot like Medicare Advantage? Would they continue to fight any effort to shore up the ACA, which of course, as Chris referenced earlier, is the other, other very important part of the Biden proposals? Where, where do you think this would come out? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, laying out the Biden proposal, uh, Chris. So the, I, I can't, uh, before I answer Susan, your specific question, just in reaction to one of the proposals. And uh, here, we, here we do have a slight, here Chris and I will differ on something. And that is lowering the age of eligibility for Medicare. I realize it's an option, Chris, but lowering it to 60. Uh, we, are in, we are increasing the age of eligibility for the social security program and moving it up from 67 eventually. At the same time, uh, you're talking about reducing the age of eligibility for Medicare. I think the two are inconsistent. And more importantly, reducing the age of eligibility for Medicare, well, again, it's an option, I understand, Chris, would impact the HI Trust Fund, which is already scheduled to be out by 2023. And so I have concerns about this particular proposal's impact on the, the HI Trust Fund. Uh, and if the HI Trust Fund, it's never happened and I don't think it will, but uh, uh, just mechanically, it supposedly would create a 17% reduction in Medicare benefits in 2023 if we do not restore the funding to uh, that, uh, to the Medicare um, Trust Fund. Now, uh, as to your question, Susan, um, Again, it all depends upon the makeup of the uh, of the new uh, uh, 117th Congress. Um, as Chris has already pointed out, uh, there's a likelihood that the, it could be a Democratic-controlled uh, 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 Senate, uh, and it will depend upon who is coming in to replace those exiting Republicans if they do exit. And my sense is uh, that. Uh, uh, those people who are who may who are on the on the verge of maybe losing their offices, friends, some friends of mine, Senator Olympia, uh, Senator Collins from Maine, uh, uh, Cory Gardner from Colorado, uh, these are kind of moderate uh, Republicans. Um, you will have a Republican Party in the in the Senate at least that would be even more. Uh, conservative than uh, it is today. So if if uh, if uh, if Republicans retain control, uh, then uh, I don't know where there's uh, where's there's uh, compromise here. I do like the idea uh, of going back to uh, what Chris has outlined, some form of a public option, of buying in uh, of the public option. And I do think that there's, if we could just 
move on, as Chris said earlier. If we could just get over this and move on, I think there are areas for for a, a public option to be considered in an in a even in a Republican controlled uh, uh, Senate and uh, uh, a Democratic House. There is compromise that's available there. And Bill, I don't want to keep on you all the responsibility to foresee the future on the Republican side, but to, to do, unfortunately, a little bit of that. If, in fact, uh, the election is uh, going to go in the direction that we've been talking about, and healthcare does emerge uh, as the driving issue for many, many, many of the voters, do you think there's an opening for Republicans here to rethink the longstanding opposition to the ACA and essentially work with Democrats on implementing some of these additional proposals? Or do you think that there will just be ongoing trench warfare? We pray for that. <laughs> I pray for that daily. Uh, I do think it's time to move on. It's been 10 years. We've had this debate going on. Let's move on. Uh, let's admit, and I think hopefully Chris would agree with me. In fact, I, I, I know he would agree with me. The Affordable Care Act is not perfect. There are areas for improvement here. It came together in a in a time that was basically uh, one side party uh, control, uh, and I think the uh, I think we could. It's it's time to move on. Yes, and I do. Yes, I think there is a possibility here that we could uh, see some uh, areas where Republicans could say, "All right." And particularly if the, and particularly, let me say, and particularly if the Supreme Court uh, uh, does not uh, take down the Affordable Care Act, I think uh, we should say, all right, enough's enough. Let's move on. Let's find ways to improve upon uh, access, uh, accessibility to health care and reducing costs, something that Republicans and Democrats should all agree to. So let's uh, say, uh that we do have a Biden administration and uh, potentially also, as we've discussed, uh, democratic control of the Senate, you still have to have a process to get things done, uh, which leads a lot of people to think that once again, we'll be looking at doing a lot of this uh, uh, legislative change on rec budget reconciliation. So let's talk about that process. As we said earlier, Bill, you are an expert in this. Uh, what what might this look like if uh, if legislation were in fact to move forward along these lines that we've been talking about next year or the year after? Well, first of all, thank you. I, I don't consider myself to be an expert. I always remember Senator Bob Dole saying an expert was a drip under pressure. Uh, but having said that, um, here's the process, which really hasn't been followed uh, for the last uh, many years. Uh, I hear a lot of people and my friends on the Democratic side saying, we're going to do reconciliation. We're going to do reconciliation. And I remind them, I say, fine, but you got to do something else before you do that. You've got to do something that Congress really hasn't done for the last four years. You have to pass something called a budget resolution, a concurrent resolution between the House and the Senate. You don't get reconciliation unless you have an agreement of, about the blueprint of the fiscal policy of this country going forward. So first of all, pass a budget resolution. Now, um, we haven't passed a budget resolution for the current fiscal year that we're in right now, fiscal year 21 that began back on October the 1st. I don't like this. Uh, Republicans did this in 2017. Uh, they had also not passed a budget resolution that year. Well past the April 15th, we should have adopted this way back in April uh, for the current fiscal year we're in. But what, what could happen here is that uh, a, a Democratic controlled Congress uh, on the House and the Senate uh, and a Biden administration could uh, call up and do a quickly in January of this year like Republicans did back in 2017 and pass a 2021 budget resolution with a reconciliation instruction included. Same thing that happened with Republicans back in 2017. They did the same thing, but they also then reconciled a savings of a billion dollars uh, to the Finance Committee and Ways and Means Committee, uh, which was designed specifically then to set up the process for repealing the Affordable Care Act. 
Eventually it did pass the House, but as we all know, that reconciliation bill late in August, or July and August failed in the United States Senate with John McCain's vote. So I can see uh, a kind of a reap, a, a one up if you like, for Democrats. So you did it to us in 2017. We can do the same thing in 2021. We can put a budget resolution together that modifies the Affordable Care Act uh, it, through a reconciliation instruction that could be adopted sometime in the spring of 20, uh, 2021. Um, this is not a simple process. I also like to remind people that. The Affordable Care Act, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act was not a reconciliation bill. We sometimes forget it was a legislation that passed in the United States Senate in, De in December of 2009 with 60 votes under regular order. Um, it went to, then we had a special election in Massachusetts there were not 60 uh, votes in the United States Senate after that special election to replace the, the, uh, Senator Kennedy's seat. Uh, and so Mrs. Pelosi simply took the legislation that passed in the Senate uh, and, and passed it straight and basically passed 200, passed, passed go and sent it to the president. Uh, now, there was a correcting bill, which was a reconciliation bill, but the underlying Patient Protection Affordable Care Act was not a reconciliation bill. It was done under regular order. I would prefer, as an old budgeteer, not to use the reconciliation process for major pieces of legislation, but to do it in a way that has bipartisan support, no surprise coming from the Bipartisan Policy Center and not to enact legislation. And this uh, reconciliation, I can see why it's simple. You only need 51 votes to pass reconciliation. Right, and, that, and that's the critical point here. You don't, uh, it, it can't be filibustered, uh, et, et cetera. So, Oh, thank you for that really uh, amazing perspective, Bill, and the, your, your grasp of budget history is, of course, phenomenal. Even for those of us who lived through it, we prefer to forget so much of it. Um, in your case, Chris, as you think about it, what, what would you add to Bill's uh, uh, elaboration of how the uh, reconciliation process could move forward? And do you think it is the the tool that would be used uh, in the early days of the Obama administration and, and in conjunction with the Congress? Well, first, um, you're right, Susan, to say um, Bill is wrong uh, to say he's not a national budget expert. He is, <laughs> clearly. Uh, secondly, um, I would say one moment, one slight correction to Bill's comment a little while ago about the Medicare 60 policy, which is it is designed explicitly not to be a drain on the trust fund. It's a separately financed policy. And indeed, um, there's a lot of confusion around the Medicare 60 policy as currently constructed by the vice president. Um, and I won't go into the details, but it, it isn't a complete lowering of the age. It's, a, it's an option and therefore would not have a burden on the solvency of the trust fund. I will say to Bill's point that early next year, we're gonna get another trustees report and it's likely to be much worse. Um, uh, there's, there's a separate irony right now that the president is now talking about tapping the trust fund to pay for his drug discount card, which is a, another kind of Unseen. Last, last second political ploy. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. So. Uh, in terms of uh, the next year's, uh, you know, strategic approach to dealing with uh, uh, the whole Biden agenda, I think that's still up in question. You know, the vice president is kind of, you, to know you, the vice president, to understand he instinctively is an institutionalist. He, he really likes working collaboratively within the traditional structures of the Senate and to work across party lines. That is his instinct. Um, it may well be the case that um, the parties polarize themselves so much that that is an impossible option and, there, and therefore you look at the reconciliation bill as a viable vehicle for a number of different things. 
um, now the reconciliation um, legislation can't be used for everything, <laughs> um, no matter what. And there's, and this is to the bill's point um, previous to our going on air, which is there's a lot of people who have a lot of big ideas about changes and they would like to use the reconciliation vehicles to do that, but they, they really couldn't. It would, it would come, it would be subject to a lot of budget points of order. Healthcare is a little bit different because there's a lot of um, financing budgetary um, movements that you can structurally change the current law to improve it and it would fall under the, um, the, the rules of the budget uh, reconciliation process. And I, I, I certainly wouldn't preclude that as an option, but, that, but I'm not gonna comment, Susan, on exactly what he'll do because one, I don't know, and that would um, be inappropriate for me so to do. So we will watch this space. Watch this space. Okay. So let's take up the topic both of you have spoken to, which is the impending exhaustion of the Medicare Part A trust fund. And as you've noted, uh, uh, at least one set of estimates said it would be exhausted in 2024. Now we think that's advanced at least a year to 2023, which is for all practical purposes, just around the corner. How should that issue be addressed? Uh, as Bill said, unless you step in and find other sources of funding for the trust fund, uh, we cut benefits by 17%, which doesn't seem likely to happen. Um, so clearly some sources of funding have to be found. Do you think that we will have in effect a simple, relatively simple approach like that? And I don't suggest by any means that it would be simple to find another uh, multiple billion dollars of revenue to pump into the trust fund. But would it be that approach or would this be a juncture to really look at the overall structure of the program and address these anomalies of part A, part B, part C, part D and find some other way to fund the Medicare program? So uh, Bill, let me start with you on that. That's a very, very good question. Uh, and uh, I struggle with this a lot. Um, personally, and Chris and you, uh, Susan, are much more attuned to the various uh, A, B, C, D uh, categories of Medicare. Uh, I personally wonder why do we continue to maintain these categories of A, B, C. I understand it's, uh, understand, uh, as you do, that B is uh, category B is funded separately as its own trust fund, an SMI trust fund, but that SMI uh, also has general revenue basically supporting it. Uh, C, uh, part of a, partly A and B, and D, uh, another set of funding. I personally would like look, have a dream that someday we can just collapse all these into one funding mechanism. I don't think it's going to be easy to do that, though, uh, and I think it will. It would take some time. Uh, so, just maybe to stir Chris up here uh, <laughs> with a proposal, I'd go the opposite direction. I, I would increase the age of eligibility for Medicare, for and that would uh, clearly bring in uh, money, uh, reduce the outflow uh, out of uh, Part A. Uh, but uh, if you don't like that uh, proposal, which I, which runs the opposite direction of where Senator, where Vice President Biden is uh, on lowering the age, uh, I feel like at a minimum we've lost about if, if, uh, we've lost about five hundred billion dollars going into the trust fund over, uh, because of the uh, of the uh, virus and and the downturn of the economy, and uh, that's revenues that's been lost coming in. Uh, because of the unemployment uh, and payroll reductions out there. I have a, a simple solution for at least restoring a big portion of that, and that is to redirect a provision, a tax provision that was in the uh, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. It's called uh, Net uh, Investment Income Tax. Uh, it's a 3.8%, it's a I believe, tax on people with very high income. I would simply redirect that uh, revenue into the trust fund to help restore it as a as a short term fix uh, to uh, at least it, we have a longer term issue. At least if we stick to the current structure, we have a uh, a thirteen trillion dollars. I realize this is over seventy five years, 
unfunded liability in the Part A trust fund. So even doing with the fix that I'm talking about is just a, just a drop in the bucket as to uh, restructuring what I think needs to be all of the uh, accounts. Chris, what, what is your perspective on this, whether there would be a relatively narrower solution drafted to shore up uh, the Part A trust fund versus much more structural change in the components right. of the program and financing? Well, I think initially, uh, remember, uh, we're talking about starting a year out where, uh, of course, the first uh, bit of business will be to address the COVID-19 ongoing challenges uh, and a host of other issues. So I do believe that initially the, on the Medicare solvency front, you'll be looking at some of the revenue options that Bill just laid out. Um, I think there will may be some other uh, prudent purchasing policy initiatives that could help constrain costs. But I think for the most part, we'll be looking early on on ways to allocate uh, revenues to prop up the trust fund. And that, that will be a more likely congressional solution, particularly when you consider all the other challenges confronting this nation uh, from COVID-19 to the impending question about the Affordable Care Act to you know, climate change, to infrastructure demands, to economics, uh, stimulus. I mean, this, this will be yet another challenge, but it's a challenge that can be immediately addressed. And then we're gonna have to look at longer term uh, approaches uh, as, we, as we move on. But I, 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 I think that's the more likely scenario and that's just Chris Jennings talking, but yes. So a question has come in from a member of the audience and I do wanna urge uh, the audience to, to send us more questions if you're so inclined. This goes back to Chris, the issue about uh, the Medicare buy-in at age 60 and the coexistence of that proposal with the public option proposal. And the questioner asks if there is a public option that is based uh, in effect on, a, on a some level uh, in comparison to Medicare payment rates, uh, how much of an additional benefit would there be in adding this Medicare buy-in piece at age 60? Uh, couldn't anybody who wanted that get as much by going through the public option? Well, that's a, that's a fair question. Part of that, I, and I think if you look at the models right now, uh, and, and I, should, I should state that the Biden administration hasn't, uh, our Biden campaign has not detailed specific reimbursement rates, payment rates, and, and nor will they or should they uh, until and unless they're uh, elected. But, but separate and apart from that, you're right. The question there is correct to say that if it does exist, there will be, um, and you, you also presume the additional enhancements of the subsidies that the vice president's proposing for the marketplace. Many people in that age group will, it will be more in their interest to opt into the marketplace policy, whether that be public option or the private plans they're being offered. In fact, you could argue that you know, for, you know, there'll be, there would be probably some millions, probably low millions of numbers of people going into the marketplace, some of whom would be over 60, primarily because their subsidies would be better there than what they're getting in the employer-sponsored coverage. But um, there would be a population, probably particularly higher income people who aren't getting as much a subsidy as lower income, uh, you know, near elderly people are, whatever you want to call it, the 60 to 65 population is. And they- Young. So, yeah, I like to think of them as very young yep. uh, as well, particularly now, um, that uh, would see that as a preferable option or could see it as an option. And the modelers that have done some preliminary analysis of that do suggest that that would be the cohort that would be most likely choosing that plan. And of course, they, I should say, they would have the opportunity to buy into the traditional or the MA plan offerings too. So, um, you know, I, I, it is a, it's another choice, it's another option, and it's something that, that I, I think a number of people will choose, but 
but there will be a number of other people within that age cohort will, who will stay in their ESI or choose to go into the marketplace uh, to get better subsidies. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. So let's go to, uh, actually, I just see another question that has popped up. So let's take this one as well. What areas of the healthcare system are you all most excited about in the context of the potential co to control costs? Uh, for example, are some states doing better than others in Medicaid and controlling costs in Medicaid that could be essentially provide lessons for carrying over into management of, of Medicare Advantage? Uh, would expanding pace to more individuals that are eligible, uh, et cetera, be another approach? Uh, that's, uh, and so forth and so on. What, sure. what, what do we, what do we, have we seen that is working that could be brought back, uh, particularly into uh, to MA? Sure, uh, I'll start, Bill, if you, if that's okay with you. I, I, I believe um, there are a lot of state models um, that both um, CMMI in the uh, Obama and in the Trump administration have been pursuing. I think. One area that uh, a lot of people are interested in are this whole issue of focusing on functional limitations, not just people who have traditional activities of daily limitation, but functional limitations that contributed to much higher cost and that the interventions could be non-medical interventions uh, that plans might be able to more creatively apply to the populations they're serving and both enhance care, but lower cost in the process. We're, we've seen that in nutrition programs, we're seeing that in housing and architectural uh, uh, modifications. Some more creative, and this is all to say, we need to look into non-medical interventions to address broader healthcare issues. And, and I think plans do have more flexibility than traditional Medicare program um, to, to focus in those areas, and, and they are starting to do just that. Um, um, the, the Congress has given them a little bit more flexibility, and the administration has signaled their desire to do that. So that would be a big area. This, this raises one other question, issue that I really wanted to make sure that we, we don't leave this program without addressing. What COVID-19 has done in terms of highlight, I mentioned the fragility of the employer-based system, but it also has exposed, of course, something that all of us in healthcare have always known, which is the inequities and the disparities of our healthcare system. And uh, we have to do such a better job on not only how we pay for care, but how we deliver care and how we enhance uh, the confidence that minority populations have in, in actually utilizing care. This is gonna be so critically important, not just for COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics, but, but also for how we move our system going forward. And I, I wanna urge everyone who happens to be participating in this, who, uh, you know, when Bill mentioned raising the age of eligibility for Medicare, and I, I know he knows that's not going to happen, but, you know, that's really very discriminatory to minority populations who don't even have access to um, affordable coverage before age 65, and then they die much earlier than the rest of us populations do. And uh, we're gonna have to really get behind this and look ourselves in the mirror and to say, we have failed these populations and we must do a better job. So I'll stop with my preaching on this, but I think all of us, cannot look at the situation that currently confronts us in a COVID-19 world and the disparate status of people who are being harmed by it without being embarrassed. And I'll stop with that. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bill, anything you want to speak to that Chris just- Well, I, listen, I, I totally agree with Chris on this one. Uh, 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 African Americans are dying at 3.1 times the rate of white Americans under this uh, terrible virus. I think absolutely, Chris is dead on on this one. This is a uh, this this uh, COVID uh, crisis has has escalated the issues of inequities in the distribution. I think this is the one thing that we will have to focus on going forward. And I would say it's not just uh, our 
African American friends, but it's also um, our Native American friends uh, on the reservations and the impact this has had on, on there. So this is an issue that we really need to address. So out coming out of this, I think the one thing that in, uh, I think is going you're going to see a lot more is a better focus on public health investments, uh, public health at the state and local level, investments that are needed there uh, to be on the preventative side. As Chris has said, the social economic determinants of health, whether it's nutrition, housing, transportation, all those things that we're gonna find that now healthcare is broader than just the hospital and the physician's office. So that's good. I think also one other thing that's coming out of this from a positive perspective is uh, with innovation. Uh, telemedicine uh, surely has certainly come into the forefront here. Things that I would have expected to take 10 years to develop, I think it probably has now been moved forward. The ability to now we can see uh, that it's possible to develop vaccines quicker, faster through uh, all the technology that we have today and biotechnologies that exist today. That's all positive, it seems to me, going forward. So all these issues are issues that, uh, while this has been a terrible, terrible uh, virus and uh, issue that we've had to deal with in a pandemic, uh, there are things that, that this is that's going to help us uh, deal with the next pandemic, which will there will be another one. Let's uh, let's be clear. It's this is not something that's going to go away in the future. Uh, well, thank you both. Well. We've already had a very thoroughgoing discussion about uh, prospects post-election, again, depending on what the outcome of the election is, both in the presidential race as well as the Congress. We've talked about uh, prospects for expanding the ACA, assuming the ACA does survive a Supreme Court challenge. We've talked about uh, the public option proposal, the Medicare buy-in proposal, some of the complexities that could arise there. Uh, we've talked uh, obviously about the impending exhaustion of the Part A trust fund, and you all uh, seem to think that there would be narrower solutions to that issue rather than broader solutions uh, and so on. And then of course we uh, had the master class from Bill about budget reconciliation and what role that could play in uh, enacting any of these proposals. I want to take a step back and ask you a very short term question as we move to close here, which is, as we all know, uh, a lot has been bollocked up in the Congress most of the year and the pandemic had something to do with it, but also uh, uh, party disputes had a lot to do with that. Uh, we did not get through surprise billing legislation. We did not get through prescription drug legislation, even though there were, was some bipartisan agreement on some components of both. Do you think that in a lame duck session, uh, any of, of those proposals could finally be put through? Uh, or other uh, major initiatives that again have been bollocked up for most of this year, are we going to have a, uh, an opening to get some of this off the plate in order to deal with these major, major, major issues that await next year. Uh, Bill, let me start with you and then we'll close with Chris. Um, very quickly, uh, I think it all depends, uh, Susan, unfortunately, on the outcome of the election because that will, uh, in fact, by the way, I'm not even sure that with the continuing resolution running out on December the 11th, that we'll even know what the makeup of the United States Senate is going to be, which will further complicate. So I would I, I'm, I, I'm, hate to be a uh, wet blanket here, uh, Susan. I think the best we can hope for is a, a, another continuing resolution in the lame duck that is to avoid a government shutdown right around the holiday season. Uh, and maybe on that uh, continuing resolution, some after, post after the elections all over, at least the presidential election, hopefully resolved by then, uh, that we will simply do uh, some of the stimulus uh, activities that, as it relates to COVID and add that to it. But I, uh, uh, an extension of some of the expiring uh, healthcare provisions, but uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic that we're gonna be able to deal with some of the issues that uh, surprise billing and prescription drugs in a lame duck session. So at most uh, another COVID relief package. Uh, at best. Assuming that uh, differences of opinion on that could be brokered. Yes. Which is a big assumption, of course, as we know. Right. Okay. Chris, from your perspective. Okay, well, really quickly, I'll just say that um, most people who predict nothing happening in the lame duck session usually come out predict looking like they're great predictors. <laughs> uh, and I will say that um, 
there are a few members of the Congress who are retiring and there's sometimes a last second moment to try to get a win. Um, surprise medical billing, there might be one slight chance for Alexander. Um, Lamar and, Alexander and, from Tennessee. Who, yeah, who and, and Senator Alexander, um, maybe. Uh, I, I think uh, if you, you can hope for, but probably not bet a lot on that. Um, Outside of that, I think Bill's projections are actually correct. And I think history will show you that almost every lame duck sessions, far more talk than walk gets done. So the 116th Congress will end not with a bang, but with a whimper. Uh, okay, well, a terrific uh, tour de force of uh, political and policy analysis uh, from my two friends, Bill Hoagland and Chris Jennings. Thanks to both of you and thanks for all of you uh, out in the audience who helped us with some very important questions. So thanks a lot, have a good day. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan.